Christian Parenting. Welcome to the Living Wholehearted Podcast. We are Jeff and Tara Matson, a husband and wife team who is shrinking the integrity gap in our own lives and helping others do the same. I'm a leadership and organizational development coach, and Tara is a licensed marriage and family therapist. We believe that if you have a following, you are a leader, and how you lead matters. Whether you are leading in the home, work, or community, we are bringing you biblical, clinical, and relational wisdom to help you in every relationship that matters most to you. None of us do this perfectly, but we are leaning into the reality of our humanity and profound wisdom of grace. So today I have Tara Sun. She's host of The Truth Talks with Tara and her upcoming book, Surrender Your Story, Ditch the Myth of Control and Discover Freedom in Trusting God, has been released and has been out for a few months. After trying to white knuckle her way through life, Tara discovered that surrendering to God will lead to a life filled with joy, peace, and meaning. She shows how to break down God's Word into understandable pieces while also adding an artistic flair through her digital art. Tara is married to her high school sweetheart, Michael, and is a mom to her newest addition, Hunter. You'll find them living and serving in Oregon. And I am so grateful to meet another Tara who lives in Oregon. This is so fun. Um, We do spell our names different, though. And most people think I spell my name T-A-R-A. Do you ever get the T-E-R-R-A version? Literally all the time. And I have to be like, no, 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 not like the earth, right? Like your name is spelled like Terra Firma, right? I'm like, no, 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 it's the other way. And so I get all the time. And sometimes I just don't correct them. So I don't either. Starbucks, particularly. I'm like, I don't care how you spell it. Just call my name so I can get my drink. Get my coffee. <laughs> sometimes I'm Sarah. Sometimes I'm Kara. So True. I just uh, go with it. Oh, I love it. Well, we're celebrating here in Oregon because we haven't had sunshine forever. And we're now hitting a sunny piece of life and it just changes everything. I feel really alive this morning. I don't know about you, Tara. Same. Same. But I, we, we have people sharing with us from all over the country um, and they're with different stories. One of the things we do at Living Wholehearted is helping leaders in the homework and community really understand their stories and how it's shaping, how they're leading today in order to be able to live fully present and embrace all that God has brought and purposed for them. So I love that this is your passion. But start with a little bit of the backstory. Who are you and what's happened prior in your story that's leading you to this message today? Yes, uh, so much. But if I were to say, you know, behind the bio, behind everything you read, I am truly at heart and will always be a very small town girl. Grew up, um, my parents have a farm here in Oregon. And so to people that see me online, it's just it's just funny because they would never guess that about me. But I'm super small town. Like you'll see me scrubbing it in my PJs, my messy hair most of the time with my son. That's that's who I am day in and day out. Besides getting to do a lot of things online through my podcast and writing books and doing ministry at home, first with my son and my husband, and then getting to do um, online ministry just to help women do a couple things and just to know God's word, to love God's word, and to live God's word. That's my main passion. Um, But the story, so Surrender Your Story, my book that came out just a few months ago, There's always, I like to tell people that good books, you know this, Tara, that good books aren't written out of something that happened to you yesterday. It's out of something that has been a part of your life, whether you realized it at the moment or not. And for me, growing up, I had always known the Lord. I had had a relationship with Him at a young age. And to be super honest, I life was really easy. And I would have told you back then that I had no reason to trust God, that Everything kind of was handed to me, Um, grades, athletics, health, everything was very smooth and simple until I was 14 and out of the blue was diagnosed with a chronic illness. And that set me into the spiral where I started to question the goodness of God, where I started to question if he was really trustworthy because he was throwing a wrench in my plans. And from that, learning to live with an illness and then also going through a process of literally dropping out of college and from the medical school route I was doing and coming home directionless, it was another wrench that God had thrown into my plans. And 
He used those two things to reveal a control problem that I had in my life. That when circumstances changed, I found myself having a really hard time trusting God. And I realized that I was holding on to my life with this death grip instead of surrendering. And so that's really how this book came to be. The Lord opened the doors to publish it. But um, when it came time to think about what this book would be, It was pretty easy to come up with what it was going to be about because not only is this a problem I've had in my life of wrestling with control, but it's also a human problem. And we see that from the beginning of the world. Mm, So true. I mean, we all have a control problem. It just looks in very subtle, covert ways. Sometimes it's super obvious. But first, before we go down the control route, because I do want to go there, Talk a little bit more about chronic illness. You know, as a mental health provider for years, I don't think people realize chronic um, health issues, chronic pain, chronic illness can actually be one of the number one contributing factors to anxiety, depression, and sometimes even suicide. We see a huge amount of just helplessness and hopelessness. Talk a little bit more about that so people understand what that's like when you get diagnosed and they're like, there's not a lot of solutions or maybe you try all the solutions. Talk about that a bit. Yeah, you know what's odd is that I have fibromyalgia, which was really weird to get diagnosed with when I was 14. I was actually just diagnosed at a hospital up in Portland, and it was this really weird thing that my 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 doctor here um, where I live couldn't figure out, so he went to a specialist, and it was really bizarre because usually fibromyalgia is something that is um, – something you get when you're older in life. So middle age to older age, it's a chronic illness characterized by just all over muscular pain, um, tension headaches, migraines, um, extreme fatigue, Mm -hmm. a lot of things like that. And it's one of those illnesses where, like a lot of chronic ones, where there's not an easy solution and there may never be on this side of heaven. So I've done everything. I've done medication. I've done um, the workout regimens, which is very helpful. And that has been super helpful. I've tried, you know, the diets, the, you know, the rest, the the limitations, the boundaries, all the things I've tried. And some have helped, um, some haven't. But it's one of those difficult things that I'm really thankful in a lot of ways that has been talked more about. You know, I feel like social media has um, opened the door for more conversations about mental health, you know that, and illness, just so people know they're not alone. And so that was my season of that. I used to be in bed all the time. I used to not be able to get out of bed the first couple years when we were trying to figure this out. But praise God, I have just year by year, it's been about 10 years since I was first diagnosed and I felt so much better. I have felt so much better by the grace of God, but it's taken so many steps mm-hmm. and also a just an acceptance that I know that God is our divine healer, but I also know that... Um, that's not guaranteed here. So uh, just trusting him every day with that, knowing, you know, if he heals me here, then great. And if he doesn't, I know someday he will. (laughs) Mm, That's a really mature place to land is that open hand posture of if you heal me, he can heal you. He he could Mm -hmm. choose to uh, do his miracles. He chooses with this person over here and he chooses not over here. I was just teaching on the story of Jairus and the bleeding woman. Mm. She's 12 years, right? Just gone to everyone, spent all her money has not found yeah. healing. And mm-hmm. um, and then you have Jairus who is panicking with his daughter is 12 and she also um, is dying and they're both desperately needing Jesus. And he chooses to heal in that place. And yet yeah. the cost of all those years of suffering takes its toll. And so talk about that turning point for you. What in your story helped you get to that landing place where you can say, if you heal me here, thank you. And if you don't, I will be healed someday in heaven um, after this story is done. But use it. Use yeah. it. You know what? I, I I love that question because I haven't thought about that in a while. But I think one of the main contributors is I had some people in my life that weren't very close to me, um, clearly, because they said things like this, where they would tell me, oh, well, you just have to do this and then God will heal you. Or have you tried this? And then that's going to heal you. And I had tried a lot of stuff. I had, you know, done lots of routes, um, lots of safe, um, secure routes, but I had tried them. Some of them worked, some of them didn't. And I had people kind of burn me in lots of ways saying, if you did this, God will Mm. heal you. And I, to be super honest, came to a point where I got really disillusioned by that. And I got 
very upset at people because I had tried things and it didn't work. And I'm like, I can't base God's goodness and his provision off of what those people are saying. And so that kind of propelled me to the place where I had to realize that God is good despite of his healing, you know, me here or not. And also just people kind of pushing me to whether it, I mean, it was, it was definitely disheartening to hear, but God used it for me to go to him and be like, okay, what, is true about you and what is true about how you heal. And I think that reminder of going through that healed me not only, you know, physically, but it's also healed me mentally and spiritually and helped me mature in that way and realize that like, you know what, God is good despite that. And he has healed me in many ways. I may not go into remission on earth side, but he has healed me in so many ways. And so I think that's a big thing that has kind of helped me come to that acceptance while also, as cheesy as it sounds, learning to surrender and realize that I'm not in control and that even though God allowed this into my life, it doesn't mean that he's no less good, you know? Mm. Yeah, your peace, your joy. Um, It's evident, Tara, Mm -hmm. as I sit with you and I see it in your face and thinking about you not being able to get out of bed. Um, So as someone's listening, recognizing we're all in a different place in our stories and there's hope here as Tara is sharing, like maybe you're not able to get out and you're wondering if your story is going to end with healing. But God's form of healing comes in all kinds of different ways um, on this side of heaven. And there's completion on the other side of heaven. Thank God for his plan there. Um, so the story is not done here on this mm-hmm. earth and in the suffering that we experience. But there is, you said something about all everybody else's answers for you. Don't you think that's a form of their control issues? That's good. I love that you said that. I think it is because in a lot of ways, I've done this to people, Tara. I've done it. And Me I've too. Given my opi- <laughs> I've, I've given my opinions in ways that opinions are okay. Like when it's a close friend, when it's someone that trusts you. But I think we can take it a step too far where we try to be a savior, right? Or we try to say, well, this is going to absolutely happen because it happened for me, guaranteed. Or it's not always that. And I love that you pointed to it because I feel like there are so many things, like you said earlier, that are sneaky. And it's like, oh, that's not controlling, but it actually is. We just don't recognize it. (laughs) Yeah. So talk about what control looks like. What did it look like in your life? What might it look like in other people's life? Yeah. Control, man, is still something I am working through. I wrote a book about it, but I'm not perfect about it, man. It's just, it's my process in my journey of still figuring that out, but knowing that God's word has all the answers for us. Control in my life has shown it to be in so many ways. And I think also in a lot of other people I've talked to, a couple ways that we can Um, just basically see if we have a control problem. Number one is if we are looking for safety and security in external circumstances in our life. A lot of times we try to control, meaning hold on to our plans and are unwilling to relent to the Lord because we feel like us being in the driver's seat is going to make sure we're safe. It's going to make sure that, okay, it's my life. I have the steering wheel. I'm in control. There's security there. So we look to control for security. We also look to control sometimes because we don't trust God, because we don't trust him to be good, because I didn't see God personally as someone who was a close and loving father. I saw him as a distant God who was up in the clouds and was banging me over the head with the Bible and wasn't close and near and loving. And so control is often... It comes from a misconception of who God is. Um, And I also think for me in my life, control showed itself to be basically a pride issue. I'm going to be super honest. I've always struggled with trying to be self-sufficient, meaning I'm strong enough on my own, that I am gifted enough so I don't need any help. I have such a hard time asking for help, even still today. And pride can show itself in being like, I am an island. I am autonomous. I don't need God, that I am enough. And those are messages you hear from this world. Yes. So those are just a few things that I've seen in my life and I know that we all struggle with. And so maybe if you're listening, you're like, I don't have a control problem. Like, I think we all do to some extent. We just have to flesh that out a little more in some of these ways. Mm, That's so good. Okay, so I think I did the math right. You're about 24. Yes. You have your first baby. Talk about not having control. I remember when I had my first daughter and I panicked because it was like the vulnerability level went up 10 octaves. I did not realize 
how um, raw you feel when you have your first yeah. child and you go, okay, <laughs> this is very different. And I remember that was when um, the Lord and I were talking as I'm rocking this little baby in a scary world. I'm working with lots of clients coming out of sex trafficking and in Christian homes, love Jesus, but they're dealing with really hard things. Wow. And I'm going, how do we do this, God? How do we do this? And God speaks to me about this thing that's now called Courageous Girls, which is walking with our daughters at every stage of their growing years and talking and processing. And one of the messages of our culture you just spoke to and you speak to in your book says, you got this. It's up to you. You take yeah. life by the horns and you make it happen. And even in our Christian homes, we have subtle ways like trying to um, – have our kids have self-control by telling them to stop doing that, giving, you know, you need the one to be more patient rather than learning how to rely on the Lord. Um, mm. There's just these subtle messages everywhere. So talk about that. What are the things that our culture tells us that's countering and maybe growing the control beast and yeah. the things that you're trying to say, hey, actually God says it this way? I love that Surrender Your Story, my book, was launched this year because I think it's been so evident, especially over the past couple years, social media has amplified these messages of manifest your destiny, you're in control. I saw um, an Instagram reel that had over a million likes, so it had crazy million views. And this was this lady saying, you are the author and the creator of your story. Woo! And she kept going on and, and you know, it just had gotten so much traction because people loved it. And so we have messages like that that are fueling this. And so I love that God had his timing in this because I'm going to be super honest. Even if you're a part of the Christian church, some of these messages have influenced you. They've influenced yes. me where we start to believe, okay, yeah, if I just think positively, if I just am a good person, if I you know, do this and this, then God will approve of me, that God will you know, let me live the way I want to live. There's a lot of these messages that are going around and they might feel really good at first. They might feel empowering. That's the whole message of a lot of feminism. A lot of things going around is empowerment, personal empowerment. And it's actually really damaging. It's hurting and devastating our souls because it's feeding us a lie that we don't need God. And it's a feeding, feeding us a lie that is actually burdening us. I think sometimes we believe that control leads to freedom. When we're in control, then I get to be free. Then I get to live the way I want. But that's a lie from the world because in Jesus's countercultural kingdom, we talk about how it's upside down. It doesn't make sense to the world. But when we surrender, we actually die to ourselves, but then we get to regain new life in Christ. So it's all of these upside down things. But the world wants us to stay stuck. The enemy wants us to stay in bondage. So that's why I wrote this book so you could find freedom in letting go because it sounds so opposite of everything within us, but it's actually so possible and it's actually so much better than those messages. It has been a joy for Jeff and I to walk with you this year. And if this podcast has impacted your life, you're not alone. You might not know that we're a part of the Christian Parenting Podcast Network of 37 total shows that reach hundreds of thousands of other people like you. Christian Parents' mission is to help parents all around the world grow into perfectly imperfect parents that God created them to be so that they can confidently raise the next generation of culture-changing Christians. They provide digital and printed resources, encouragement that is rooted in biblical truth, and they have an entire network of faith-based podcasts just for families, including this one. But creating resources and running podcasts is just not free. Just like everything else in the world, these things take time and financial commitments. And as a donor-based ministry, Christian Parenting relies on generous donors like you to continue to make podcasts like this one happen. So if you love this podcast, and I hope you do, would you consider giving a year-end gift to Christian Parenting? We're seeking to raise $23,661.58 by December 31st so that we can continue to produce these products and these podcasts and reach even more parents in 2024. Every gift matters, and every gift makes a difference. You can give your best gift by December 31st to help end the year strong and reach our goal. Give today at cpgive.org. That's cpgive.org. I love it. So give a couple tips. Like what are some 
maybe practical. One of the things I hear you saying, and I'll just frame it in my own language, you add or take away, but um, <laughs> is a bit of the reframing of the voice and, and who you're listening to. So um, the voices are so loud about your life is up to you. And even as Christians, you said like my issue would be being the good girl. you like, if I obey, then life should mm-hmm. be pretty good. We don't see that anywhere in scripture. You, you see right. all kinds of obeying happening and it's there's suffering and there's hard. I mean, all the disciples, you know, right. died because of their following Jesus. Yeah, yeah. There's there's persecution. But that idea that um, controlling your destiny is everywhere. So reframing your thoughts, focusing on where you're listening. Are you listening to God's kingdom economy or the world's economy? Maybe name a couple more places of, okay, I've got some control issues. What other things can I be doing or truths that I need to be leaning in on? Yeah. You know, a truth that automatically comes to mind is a verse that's so anchored in the book, but then also in my life. And it's a popular one. I'm sure many, if you know God's word, knows knows this one. It's Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. It's just basically Paul reminding us of our origin, really, that our salvation was, first of all, not from us. It was a gift of God. It was the grace of God. We can't boast in it, meaning we can't take pride in our lives. And it, that sounds bad, but it's actually really good news because Jesus is the one who secured it for us. And so, when we listen to those messages of people saying, I get a boast in who I am. It's my works that save me. It's my works that get me to the success or the followers or the influence that I'm at. Anchor yourself in Ephesians 2. Actually, the whole chapter, I love that whole chapter because it reminds us of our home base and it grounds us like you were talking about, Tara. It reminds us that it's actually God, that we can't manifest anything. And it, verse, verse 10 tells us that we've been created for good works but it's so that we can live for God. There's a second part of that verse that says we were created by God for good works that we should walk in them. So I just think this verse is so grounding and it reminds me every single time I scroll and I see a message that doesn't feel right. First of all, take it to God's word. You said it, Tara. Go to the scripture and say, is this what God's word really says? do a little check, and then also just take it back to that verse because we have to remember that God has given us really good worth and value. I think that's a lot of times why we try to control because we want to make the mark that we want on the world. But the truth is, verse 10, God created us for incredible works. We just have to walk in them. But if we're walking in the world, we're not going to make that that splash. So I don't know. I like that truth, and I think that covers so much that we that we come to every day. It's um. It's so good. And it's the struggle, I think, particularly for those who are naturally bent towards high capacity leadership roles. Mm-hmm. So that's a high yeah. part of our audience who are listening. So I want you to speak even in your own journey here. You've written a book while you were having a baby, Tara. Let's just say out loud, like <laughs> yeah. that's a hard reality and it's amazing. Right? Woohoo! <laughs> but also that took a lot um, out of you. You've got a, a thriving podcast and you talked about all these successes. It sounds like you were in med school at some point. So I'm getting into the fact that you are driven. You're there. So hard things don't scare you. And yet you're saying, hey, God's the one who grows the fruit. How do you yeah. stay grounded in that when things are successful? Because it's so human nature for us to get yeah. locked up in the numbers of how many mm-hmm. books are being sold, who's listening to the podcast, right. all of those kinds of things. So what are the things that you're doing Um, in your own story that are helping you keep your hands open to use your words and not control it or find your identity in in all the successes? Yes. I love this question because it's something I'm currently walking through. My book has been out for almost two months and it's my first one and I'm learning so much about it. And I am also having to surrender so much of the book. God is so funny because he does not quit and he does not relent in teaching me about surrender even through this book. And so I've had to do a few things personally. I've had to, number one, remind myself of a big umbrella truth, and that is that if God brought me to something, then God's the one who gets the glory and God's the one who provides the results that you know, we're told, I believe it's in Second Corinthians or one of the epistles where Paul says that, yeah, we are, you know, we're the ones who plant the seeds. We're the ones who do the work on the ground, boots on the ground, but God's the one who brings the growth. So I have to remind myself of that. And when I get discouraged super easily about maybe something not selling well or something not getting as many hits or views or things like that, I have to remember, I'm like, okay, am I doing this for the Lord? Am I doing this out of a good spirit? Have I prepared? Did I teach well? Then if yes, then I can just rest easy and I can know that it's touching who God wants it to touch. And then I also have to 
log out. I have to, I am not very good at logging out. Um, my computer is open a lot of the times. I, um, you know, our phones are super accessible, but you have to, I've had to delete the app. I've had to make hard boundaries for me being a new mom, especially like I am not going to be on my computer around my son. Um, if I can help it, I maximize nap time. Let me tell you that, but, um, I'm not going to be on around him. And I'm also, I'm going to be super honest with the comparison game. Just people listening that, like you said, are high capacity overachievers. That one of the easiest things to get people like us down, or really anyone like us down, is looking at what other people are doing in their successes. And first of all, we need to learn how to celebrate other people in the body of Christ, obviously, because their strengths are not ours, and we all build up an incredible body. But I'm just going to give you permission right now to you know, mute someone or just, you know, stop looking at them and follow if you need to, because if it's causing a root of bitterness, if it's causing comparison and jealousy and envy, it's okay to take a break. And it's okay to take a step back. Um, and then take that time to work on your heart and ask the Lord to help you celebrate instead of compare. But I've had to do that a lot too, where it's like, I love this person and I'm really proud of them, but I know that the enemy is going to use that on me right now. So I'm just going to, I'm going to step away from that account or something. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful, but it's been helpful for me. <laughs> mm, that's great advice, actually. And I would just say when you're t- talking about pulling away and doing that reflecting, the question is, you know, what is going on inside of me that I need to, it's being triggered by that yeah. person rather than it being about that person. Oftentimes exactly. I hear people being like, oh, they're all they do is talk about themselves or there's a reason why we want to tear them down. And, and instead of doing that, you might have loved them until you started to feel jealous. <laughs> and then, yeah, um, yeah. but going back to, yeah, let the Lord search me, know me, lead me in the way everlasting. So there's this yes. um, posture that you're speaking to, and it's it's ongoing. It's not a once and arrived, it's an ongoing posture. So I love the intentionality yep. of what you're, you are doing even right now, even as a new mom. So speak a little bit. You write about um, how to help people find their purpose, like what God's plan for you 101. What would be some of the wisdom you would give someone who's saying, I, I don't even know where where to go, what to do um, with my life? You know, I think it's funny because a lot of times, you know, you can be in a vocation, you can be in ministry, you can be leading, but still not feel like you found God's will for your life. You can be like, well, this is a job, but I don't really feel like I'm in the center of God's will, which God doesn't necessarily say your will is to be this or that. It's not necessarily an earthly vocation. It's a spiritual reality. And I have a chapter. I believe it's chapter six. It's bad. I can't remember the exact That's chapter, impressive, though. I don't um, <laughs> number. But I believe it's called God's Will 101. And the reason why I included it in a book on surrender is because when we surrender our lives, we surrender, just like Luke tells us when Jesus was in the garden, we take on the same posture, not my will, but yours be done. But then it begs the question, what is God's will, right? So I thought we should do a chapter on it. And there's been books written on it, you know, comprehensive books. But we go through really quickly in the chapter about what it means to understand two facets of God's will, um, which you can read in the book. Um, But there's two facets of God's will that tell us how to live. And I think a lot of times we get tripped up on not knowing what God has revealed to us um, and feeling like we don't have everything that we need to keep going in life. And so I always come back to 2 Peter 1, 3, and it tells us that God has given us everything we need for life and godliness, that He that we have our we have the Spirit, we have the Holy Spirit, but we also have God's Word, which is the primary vessel in which tells us how to live. That's God's will for our lives. And so for the person who may not know what God's will is for their lives, I can tell you without a doubt that it's found in God's Word. It may not be okay, like you know, Tara, you need to go to the store at this time, or you need to take this trip, or you need to say yes to this opportunity. God's word isn't always so specific in the Bible within the pages, but he has overall truths that can apply to the specifics. Like he's very specific about those things with big umbrella truths that never change. And so going to God's word to remember that your identity is found in him, and it's found in his word and that he will guide you, I think that's a comfort because we don't have to be on the scavenger hunt. God's will for our lives is not this thing that this rung on the ladder that we can never reach. And I think we need to stop overcomplicating it. We just need to follow what God's word says. And if we are, then we're in God's will and then doing the vocations, the jobs that we have as an add-on, but not as our primary, you know, as our primary identity. Mm. 
I love that. I always picture um, our assignments throughout our life, kind of like our uh, clothes we wear. And so I don't know if you're like me, but I have had different fashion design um, interests yep. over the years. <laughs> Some I look back or hairstyles or even the way I decorated my house, there's different seasons. And I go, I loved that. Now I would never put that in my home. And right. there's this <laughs> process in our journey that the assignment sometimes um, in the fashion um, or things we're into, we think that's God's will. That changes, yeah. that comes and goes, but who we are, what's inside the clothes is really the the will part of being connected to Him, loving Him, right. and being a vessel to love others. And it comes in lots of different assignments throughout our lives, and there's a lot of freedom there. It's also another part of your message of letting go of the control of trying to figure out the bullseye of what it is I'm supposed to do and more about the journey of being in relationship with God and, and the fun adventure. Um, yeah. So it's so funny looking back for me, I'm in my mid forties and just that constant going, huh, the assignments have changed a lot over the years, yeah. but the core of what I feel called to hasn't changed. And I'm still the same one at my early twenties that I'm here in my mid 40s, saying the same things, it. doing the same things, but the package has looked different over time. Um, right. And so that's so encouraging, especially with different seasons of our life where we don't have capacity in different ways. Um, right. So right. why don't you leave our, our audience with one last word of encouragement when you think about um, really at the end of the day, what do you hope people get from your book? I have prayed so much for the people reading this book, and I will c continue to. And the, the biggest prayer that I keep coming back to is just helping people release their burdens. And I think of the people who listen to this podcast, like you said, people that are very much like us, high achievers, high capacity, go-getters. And I feel like if you're anything like me, that you're tired that maybe you're weary from the assignment, whatever you're doing. And I feel tired. I feel weary currently. And the reason why I wrote this book was because we always feel like we need to strive and we always feel like we need to be in the driver's seat and we can't let down for a moment because if we do, then everything's going to come crashing down. But I want to remind you that the freedom is letting God have control First of all, control is never ours, but we just got to give it back to him and acknowledge that it's his. But knowing that when Jesus told us to come to him because we have rest, that includes surrendering. And I want you to know that surrender isn't you know passive. It doesn't mean sitting on your hands. It doesn't mean that you can't go out and use your gifts. Surrender just means I'm going to walk in faith and obedience and what God says. So that's active, but I'm going to trust him with the results. And I'm going to be willing to pivot if something else happens. So I guess, like you said, my prayer is that people would find a release of the burden of having it all under control because you can't, but that's actually really good news. And when you do, you'll find a bigger purpose and better results for your life than you ever could on your own. God does immeasurably more, like Ephesians 3 tells us, than we could ever ask, think, or imagine. And that only happens when we let him have control. So that's that's my prayer in more words than I probably should have, but <laughs> it was right on, spot on, Tara. Thank you so much for your wisdom, your vulnerability, your honesty, and your your open hands to trust God with the results here as you've obeyed um, in writing this book and doing your podcast. Tell people where they can find you. Yes. Oh, thank you, Tara. You are a sweet friend, fast friend. I'm so thankful for this, you know, this hour together and, and with your friends listening. I'm so honored. Um, as far as connecting, you can grab Surrender Your Story anywhere you get books. Amazon is obviously the easiest place to do that. Um, would love to connect with you through there because as Tara knows, it's the biggest, it's the biggest part of your heart in a lot of ways. And um, I also have a podcast called Truth Talks with Tara, and you can get that anywhere. Um, you listen to podcasts as well and over on Instagram at um, Miss Tara Sun. So I love it. Well, Tara, you have been such a gift to me and just resonating with so many of the pieces. So I'm going to tell our audience, there's two places I'm going to send you today. Um, I'm breaking all the rules. My marketing team is going to get really mad at me, but <laughs> I, want, I want to send you over to livingwholehearted.com. If you're an emerging leader, I'm just hearing Tara and I'm going, these are things that even the seasoned leaders haven't gotten to yet. I mean, we just white knuckle our way through life. And so much of what we're doing at Living Well Hard, we want to come alongside you. If you've got dreams and visions and you have an emerging, um, you know that God's giving you an assignment and you want some 
counsel, coaching, just someone to come alongside you, go to livingwholehearted.com and reach out to one of our executive coaches. This is what we love to do. We're going to be doing more writing retreats and uh, we have our wholehearted leadership cohorts. Our women's cohort is opening up again for one year and the leaders in that um, group are a lot like Tara or me and we're coming together and we're sharpening one another and we're um, continuing to grow from the inside out. And then I want to send you over to Courageous Girls because everything that Tara is saying, I'm like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, we want to continue to see moms and daughters being free to um, trust God with who he says he is and trust him with who he says they are and to really listen to the voice of grace and not all the, the noise that's all around us. So go check that out at mycourageousgirls.com. If um, anything inspired you today from Tara, I think you'll find so many resources there to help you raise a daughter that can stand tall and use her voice like Tara is today. Um, So don't forget to go get her book, Surrender Your Story, Ditch the Myth of Control, and Discover Freedom in Trusting God. Until next week, be the leader you would follow. This podcast is powered by Living Wholehearted, Courageous Girls, and the Christian Parenting Podcast Network. Thank you for joining us in this critical movement of shrinking our integrity gaps between what we preach and live.